I Am the Great Horse, chapter 26, Bactria, 329 BC. Zeus hides the edge of the world. To reach Bactria, King Darius's brother said we had two choices. Go back the way we had come until we met the road from Zadrakarta and then turn due east, the easy route, but also the one Bessus expected us to take. Continue east through the mountains. Turn north along the Kabul Valley and double back over the Cauc uh, Caucasus Range, supposed to be impassable in the winter. No prizes for guessing which one Alexander chose. We climbed high, right into the clouds. There was not much snow if we were careful to stay on the road, but it was cold. Every time we camped, we had to paw through the frozen crust for thin yellow stalks to graze. On all sides, snow-capped peaks pierced the sky while the wind cut through our winter coats. At night, I did my best to shield young Hoplite from the weather. Our grooms folded our cloths over our backs, and we all squeezed up close for warmth. But poor Borealis, on the end of the line, shivered through the nights with his tail tucked between his legs, and his ribs stuck out even more than mine. Charm sneaked extra handfuls of barley into his nose bag, but it made little difference. Our riders were no happier. Hunched in their cloaks with their bare legs shaking and their fingers too swollen to grip our reins. It was a good thing we didn't have to fight any battles on that march, I can tell you, because I'm not sure any of us could have moved faster than a trot, and the men could barely grip their spears. Lots of ghosts, human and horse, shivered into the freezing air during that march. Besides wanting to catch the traitor Bessus, un prepared by attacking him from the rear, there was another reason Alexander took the hardest route. But we horses only found out what it was when we stopped in the shadow of the mountain to dig the foundations for yet another Macedonian garrison. Alexandria under the Caucasus. Ha, there's a surprise. Our riders fell silent as they considered the line of jagged peaks that bared our way. Bard. We chewed our bits, and poor Borealis's ears flicked back in misery. But Alexander stared up at the snowbound mountains with the familiar light in his eyes that meant trouble. He rode me forward a few paces and whispered, Look, Bucephalus, the Caucasus Mountains. Aristotle says you can see the edge of the world from the highest peaks. That's where Zeus chained immortal Prometheus to a rock as punishment for giving men the gift of fire and sent a vulture to peck out his liver every day for a thousand years. Prometheus grew a new liver overnight so the torture could begin afresh. Maybe I'd better make the proper sacrifices before I go up there, eh? He pulled my ear like he used to do back in Macedonia. Then his face took on the stony expression he'd worn most days since we left Lake Seistan, and he wheeled me back to join the guard, shouting for someone to fetch charm. The others all looked at Iolius, who trotted off on Hades, grumbling other, under his breath that he wasn't a messenger boy. Perdiccas cleared his throat. <clears throat> Alex, um, <clears throat> are we stopping here before we... Alexander cut him off. If I were Bessus, I'd set an ambush in one of these passes. We have seven routes to choose from. Which one would you take the army through if you were commander? Perdiccas stared up at the snowy peaks and stroked Apollo's winter-furred neck. I'd choose the lowest, Alex, with the easiest climb and the least snow. I know it'll be thawing soon, but the men are half starved and the horses are no better. They can't go on much longer without grazing. Alexander nodded. That's what I thought you'd say. If Bessus has heard we're coming this way, he'll assume the same. So the lowest pass is out. But does he still have that treacherous horse master with him, whispering in his ear about me? We could pace, take one of the middle passes to confuse him, Lamedon ventured, or split up the army, send the baggage through, 
train through the lowest pass and take the cavalry over one of the others, Ptolemy suggested. Alexander gave Ptolemy a scathing look. Don't be stupid. That's hostile territory over there. The last thing we want to do now is divide our men when Bessus might be waiting on the other side to pick us off. Have you learned nothing? Ugh, where's Iolius, Iolius gotten to? Ah, at last. Hades trotted up with charm perched awkwardly on his withers in front of Iolius. My groom gave me an anxious look. After satisfying herself that I was all right, she slithered off Hades and bowed her head to Alexander. He frowned down at her. Any dreams about these mountains, Charmides? She gazed up at the snowy peaks and shivered. No, sir, no dreams. I'm sorry. Alexander smiled. Good. Then we'll take the highest pass. It's the most direct, and Darius's brother tells me the land on the other side of this range is fertile. The crops should be growing by the time we get down, so we'll be able to rest and eat before we fight. Someone bring me a sheep. I need to make a sacrifice to my father, Zeus. He glared at the members of his guard, who were all looking at Iolius again. Why is everyone so slow to obey me lately? Move! The cooks used what little food remained to give the army a hot meal before tackling the pass. And we horses had double rations in our nose bags that night. In the morning, we set out on the long climb over the Caucasus Mountains. No one complained that we were taking the highest pass. In fact, those of the guard who had been in the Aristotle school with Alexander seemed almost as excited about seeing the edge of the world as he was. It was a long, slow, leg-trembling climb. The road from Lake Sastian had been bad enough for horses, but this was much steeper. Halfway up, our riders tied little leather bags over our hooves like they did back at the Persian gates, and we struggled on through knee-deep snow to the crest of the pass. We were so high up and the air was so thin and cold we could barely breathe. Poor Borealis staggered from one side of the path to the other, his flanks heaving and blood dripping from his nose. Alexander urged me on with his strong legs every time I tried to slow down, so he reached the top ahead of everyone else. While I gulped the thin air and tried to turn my tail to the wind, Alexander shaded his eyes and squinted east for a long while, his heart beating very fast. The army was strung out below us like a snake, winding all the way back down to the newest Alexandria. Clouds filled the valleys behind us. I could not see anything under them. As the guard caught up, Alexander turned, frustrated. Do you see it, gentlemen? Can anyone see the ocean at the edge of the world? I just see clouds, Perdiccas said. I see water, I think. Ptolemy said. Maybe Zeus is hiding the edge of the world from us because he doesn't want us to go there, Leonidas suggested, stroking Borealis's sweaty neck. The brown stallion's legs were still trembling from the climb. Alex, I don't think my horse is going to make it much farther without a rest. Alexander scowled. We haven't time to rest. Zeus is hiding the ocean precisely because he wants us to go there and see it with our own eyes. Then Iolius, who had been sulking at the back on Hades, looked down the other way and sit groaned. Forget the ocean. Look what Bessus has done. Alexander rode me to the other side of the pass and uttered a curse. The rest of the guard joined us and stared silently. It was bad. Below us, in a shimmering haze, lay the valleys of Bactria and the fertile fields Darius's brother had promised. But instead of the crops that should have been growing in them, we could see only black earth and deserted villages. Through the haze of smoke, a river glimmered in the distance. Bessus had used the same trick the Persians had tried at Tarsus. He'd burned all the available food. Zeus, help us all, Leonidas whispered in dismay. Alexander turned on him with a scowl. Pull yourselves together. 
gentlemen, this isn't the first time we've been hungry. We'll just have to press on. At least it doesn't look as if he plans to fight us here. The plains on the banks of the Oxus will be much better for our phalanx and the cavalry. We'll soon finish him off when we get there. The guard stared at the distant river with hopeless eyes. They knew that what seems close from the top of a pass is a lot farther away than it looks. It was all too much for, for Borealis, who gave a horrible groan and crumpled into the snow. Even as Leonidas leaped off him, Borealis's ghost rose slowly from his body and limped over to the rocks at the side of the trail. I shivered all over. My friend, my solid brown friend, dead! I raised my head and let out a wild neigh that was answered back down the trail by Potassios and several other horses. Alexander jerked my rein and shouted at the guard to stop being so defeatist. He said they'd soon find more horses once they got out of the mountain, and Bessus was obviously scared of us, or he wouldn't have burned all the crops and fled. Poor Borealis didn't even get the next city named after him because Alexander was in such a hurry to catch Bessus and the horse master that none of us stopped there. The most important city in Bactria kept its silly name of bulk deserters our enemy's trail led to the river we'd seen from the top of the pass but first we had to cross a horrible desert which was the last thing we needed after tackling snowbound mountains in winter alexander however made the men march day and night and kept pushing me into a trot when i would rather have walked by the time we guard reached the river, Oxus, and discovered Bessus had burned all the bridges to stop us from following him across, only Hephaestion's cavalry was still with us. Alexander scowled at the smoking remains of a bridge and cursed under his breath, This Bessus is getting seriously annoying, he muttered. Hephaestion smiled. You've got him on the run, Alex. We'll catch him. We've just crossed the Caucasus Mountains when winter with nothing to eat but our mules and marched a desert, uh, across a desert with nothing to drink but wine. Nothing stops us. The men worship you, Alex. They'll do anything you tell them because they know you'll always get them through the tough times and you'll always be the first to battle. They might fear you sometimes, but they will always love you. I never realized before you gave me my command, but you're like a god to them. Alexander cheered up a bit at this. That's not surprising. The oracle said I'm the son of Zeus, after all. He ordered the guard to light fires as a guide for the rest of our herd, then rode me slowly beside Potassios while he and Hephaestion made plans to cross the river. As flames crackled to life along the riverbank, he squinted into the darkness and demanded, Where's the ar rest of the army? They're so slow. They'll be here, Alex, Hephaestion said. They haven't got old Parmenio to lead them home now, have they? Alexander smiled grimly, only as ghost. Men and horses appeared out of the night in a straggling line, exhausted, and finally, the baggage train trailed in with our grooms. But not all our herd had followed us across the desert. The Thess Thessalian cavalry had discovered there was a direct road west from Bessus's captured city and gone that way instead. Alexander's hand trembled on my rein as Commander Cletus brought him the bad news. Apparently, the the Thessal uh, Thessalians had requested that their final pay and bonuses be sent to Ecbatana so they could pick it up on their way back to Greece. While I stretched out my nose and nickered to Zephyr, pleased to see she had made it across the mountains and the desert, Alexander said to Cletus in a dangerously quiet tone, And you just let them go? What else could I do? The old cavalryman met his gaze. They were volunteers, remember? General Parmenio's execution upset them. They'd had enough. And what about you, Cletus? Alexander said, still quietly. You served under General Parmenio. Have you had enough? My cavalry will follow you until we've finished what we came to do. 
Cletus said carefully. And mine, Hephaestion said. Putting a hand on Alexander's arm, he whispered, Commander Cletus saved your life at the Granicus, Alex. You don't have to worry about his loyalty. Your army has followed you through snowbound mountains, across deserts to get here. We've kept, we've lost a few thousand Greeks who didn't want to fight in the first place, that's all. Half their mounts were exhausted anyway. We've plenty of men left to deal with Bessus. Alexander closed his eyes and gripped my mane. He controlled his breathing and nodded to Cletus, his face stony. Thank you for the message. Hephaestion, go and arrange the necessary funds for the Thessalians. Uh, Thessalians, tell your men to start making rafts with their tent covers. Use your horse's hay to stuff them so they'll float. We'll start crossing tonight. Cletus gave him a sharp look. Tonight, Alexander? Yes, tonight. I've got to catch Bessus and that traitor of a horse master before the rest of my army decides to leave me. He acted tough until Cletus left. But when we were alone in the night with the black water of the Oxus sliding past us, the hugeness went out of him and he gripped my mane in confusion. I don't understand, Bucephalus. Why are they all so scared of following me these days? First the Amazons, then General Parmenio, and that idiot Philo, and my shield-bearer Demetrius, and now the Thessalians. Who's going to be next? I can't stop now when we're within the sight of the edge of the world and immortality. Even if the oracle was wrong about that, how can I possibly go home to Pella and hunt lions after having all of Persia kneel at my feet? I nudged him to remind him I wanted my supper before someone stitched it into a raft, and he sighed. Ah, oh, my faithful horse, at least you'll never leave me. Come on, let's see if we can find your groom. Harpena leads the herd. It took us five days to cross that river. We horses swam across with lines of rafts tied to our tails, then swam back again to collect more rafts and back across again until we had crossed the Oxus seven times. We saw some of Bessus's scouts on the other side when we resumed our march. They took one look at us and fled across the plain. I don't think they were expecting to see us so soon. Ha! But Alexander let them go so they could take the bad news to their boss. A few days afterward, a messenger arrived from the Persian resistance and told Alexander that they had now a new leader called Sp <laughs> Spitamenes, who would hand the traitor Bessus over to us so we could finish things here and take our men home. All Alexander had to do was send a Macedonian armor with a small escort to collect the prisoner. It's bound to be another trick, Alexander muttered. Look what happened last time I agreed to, to meet Bessus back at the tomb of Cyrus the Great. But the message is from this new man, Spidamenes, Leonidas pointed out. If he's telling the truth, Bessus is a prisoner. Since he had lost Borealis, Leonidas was now riding Aura, who kept neighing for the golden Mardian filly. I gave her a special knicker because I knew what a sad time this was for her. It was even harder for Aura than usual because she had lost her own foal. Oxarthes looked a bit confused at the mention of Cyrus the Great's tomb, but he nodded and said, I know Spitamenes. He is an excellent fighter who once fought in my brother Darius's army. He comes from this area and he follows our prophet Zoroaster and worships the sacred flame. I believe he'll hand over the traitor as he promised. Alexander gave King Darius's brother a narrow-eyed look. Maybe, and maybe the message came from Bessus himself, in the hope of luring me to a remote place where he can kill me. I want a volunteer to take 5,000 men and go meet this Spidamenes to arrange the transfer of the prisoner. Once there, you'll leave most of the men in hiding and go on with a small escort as requested but take a trumpeter with you in case there's trouble. The rest of us will make camp here. When you're satisfied it's not a trick, send a message to me. His eyes glinted like they used to back in Greece whenever he dared his friends to volunteer for a special mission. It's dangerous, 
Whoever goes will be a hero. The guard glanced at one another. No one looked very keen. Iolius fiddled with Hades' mane, obviously hoping he wouldn't get the job. Oxarthes said, I'll happily do it, King Alexander, but they asked for a Macedonian, and if I go, Spitaminis will probably kill me. He does not understand your vision of Persians, Macedonians, and Greeks forming one nation. Nor, it seems, do most of my Macedonians, Alexander muttered, but if anyone heard, they kept quiet. I'll go, Ptolemy said. The others breathed again, and Harpina was soon trotting off proudly at the head of a herd of 5,000 men and horses. As Ptolemy urged her into a canter, she made herself huge and arched her speckled neck. Sometimes Harpina forgets she is only a mare. What next? Over the next few days, I was lonely in the horse lines without Potassios or Borealis. Charm took pity on me and tethered Apollo next to me instead. He was not as solid as Borealis nor as friendly as Potassios, and he wasn't my own colt like Hoplite, but I'd known him a long time, and he had not complained once going over the mountains or across the desert. After giving him flat ears to warn him not to steal any of my hay, I put my teeth gently on his withers and began to mutual groom. Bliss! By the time Charm came back from settling Aura, who was still prone to fits of frantic neighing for Caspia, we had reached each other's rumps. She smiled at our half-shut eyes and scratching teeth. There, Bucephalus, she said, patting my neck. That's better, isn't it? Don't worry, Harpina, we'll be back soon. King Alexander's had a message from Ptolemy. It doesn't seem to be a trick, and I haven't had any bad dreams about it. We're going to collect Bessus tomorrow. Groom gossip was all about Bessus that night. They said Alexander had told Spidamines to chain the traitor naked to a post at the side of the road with a slave collar on his neck. They said he was going to drag him to death behind his chariot, the same way he had killed the boss of Gaza. This was clearly stupid because we didn't bring any of our chariots with us over the Oxus. Also, when the grooms didn't know about the trick at the oh, also, the grooms didn't know about the trick at the tomb of Cyrus the Great when Bessus was supposed to have returned to Charm in exchange for Prince Aucus, but instead brought the horsemaster and his knife. If they had, they might have known Alexander wanted the traitor to have a much slower death. The punishment for traitors. In the morning, Alexander orders Tidios to get Aura ready for Prince Aucus and tells Charm to put all my tassels and best parade cloth on me. Then we lead the army up the road to find Bessus, Aucus riding proudly on Aura beside his uncle Oxarthes. The two gray mares make a good pair, but Aura's dapples are darkest and most beautiful. She neighed a few times to Caspia as we left the lines, and, but being up front with the guard put her out of hearing distance of the filly, and she soon pricks her ears and relaxes her mouth to Aucus's gentle hands. When we come to the chained Bessus, Alexander halts me and stares down at him with a funny expression. You humans always look strange without your clothes on because we horses don't often see you undressed. Bessus's muscular body is covered in black curly hair and lots of bruises. Ugh, the heavy collar around his neck is made of wood and chained to a post at hop height, so he is on his knees. A deep cut across his forehead trickles blood down the side of his face where it forms a crust in his whiskers. Flies are feasting on it. His hands are bound tightly behind him and he hasn't got a tail to flick him away. His black eyes glitter with hatred as he stares up at Alexander. He bares his teeth at Oxarthes and Aucus and says, I see King Iskander has been forced to adopt King Darius's family because he was too young and irresponsible to have a family of his own. Alexander's eyes narrow. King Darius's brother rides his gray mare closer to the post and spits on the prisoner. Silence. You'll speak only when you are spoken to. 
But Bessus keeps grinning up at Alexander. What are you waiting for, Macedonian midget? Kill me! I know you want to. Your precious little groom's dead, you know. She ran off back in Caspian gates. By now, her bones will have been pecked clean by the crows. Alexander's fist clenches, but he keeps his hand away from his sword. Bessus obviously has no idea Charm found us. Oxarthes snaps something in Persian, and an angry stream of squeals pass between them. Aucus listens silently, his face grave and his fist resting on the jeweled dagger in his belt. Alexander motions Oxarthes back and rides me up to the post so I am nearly stepping on the prisoner's legs. He frowns down at Bessus and asks, Why did you betray and kill your own king? Bessus bares his teeth. To please you, Iskander, you want the Darius dead, I saved you the trouble. You should reward me and set me free. I am great king of Persia now, and you are a traitor. You'll die a traitor's death. You'll never be great king of Persia, uh, Bessus growls. The priests wouldn't bless you, would they? Only those of royal blood can rule Persia. You're a barbarian invader, nothing more. Kill me, have done with it. Alexander's breathing quickens. This time his hand does go to his sword, and Bessus's gaze follows it. His eyes glitter. But Oxarthes touches the king's elbow and says, King Iskander, he killed my brother, who was the rightful great king, and took the crown for himself. He must stand trial before a Persian court and be publicly executed in a painful manner. But first he must have his nose and ears cut off in the way of our people to show he is a traitor. Bessus tugs at his bonds and squeals something in Persian, which Oxarthes ignores, although it makes Aucus bite his lip. Alexander narrow his eyes. He draws his sword and lowers it to Bessus's right ear. Bessus cringes and his sweat sharpens. I can do this quickly or slowly, Alexander says. Tell me the truth. Where is my father's horse master? Bessus looks confused. You must remember, the Macedonian who was with you at the tomb of Cyrus the Great and tried to kill me, the one who killed my dog, he fled with you from the Caspian gates. Where did he go? Where did he go? Is he with Spitamines? The prisoner bursts out laughing. How would I know? King Iskander conquers hundred cities, defeats King Darius' immortal army. He's worried about a lame barbarian from his own country who can hardly walk without his horse. Maybe you got to look for him among the Scythians. He laughs so much he coughs up blood. Alexander stares down at him in disgust. He puts away his sword and backs me farther from the post. He looks thoughtfully at Prince this man killed your father. It's about time you bloodied that dagger I gave you. Cut off his ears and nose for me. Don't be afraid. He can't hurt you now. Aucus swallows. He looks down at Bessus and shakes his head slightly. Let me have the honor, King Iskander, Oxarthes says quickly, drawing his own dagger. But Alexander rides me between the gray mare and the post, so Oxarthes can't reach the prisoner. No, he says. I want King Prince Aucus to do it. The prince is only ten. When I was ten, I killed my first lion. When I was twelve, I tamed Bucephalus. When I was sixteen, I led an army into my first battle and killed my first man. I'm not asking the boy to kill him, merely to take off a couple of ears and a nose. It doesn't matter if he makes a mess of it, because Bessus doesn't deserve to be treated any better. It'll be good training for when the boy is older and ready to fight at my side. Take out your dagger, Aucus. Get down off that mare and do it. Come on. You're no coward. I know that. Slowly, Aucus slips off Ara's back and draws his dagger. Bessus bares his teeth at him and rattles in his chains. The prince hesitates. Bessus laughs and says something in Persian. Aucus's fist tightens on the dagger. Alexander smiles coldly. Go on. But Aucus cannot do it. 
he sets the dagger to Bessus's ear, makes a line of blood, and snatches back his hand. There are tears in his eyes when he turns to face us. Please, Uncle Alexander, let Uncle Oxartes do it. Bessus laughs out loud. You better hurry up and sire yourself a son who can stomach the sight of blood, King Iskander. This pretty pup of Darius's will never be strong enough to sit on your throne after you've gotten yourself killed. Alexander leaps down off my back, seizes Aukus's hand, and forces the blade against the prisoner's ear. Do it, he shouts. If you don't, I'll have you whipped for disobeying me in front of my own men. Aukus shakes his head. No, I cannot. You can and you will, Alexander hisses. He drags his hand down and Bessus's ear half comes off messily. Bessus screams. Aukus struggles free, drops the dagger, grabs Aura's reins, and vaults onto her. He gallops back the way we came, past the long column of horses and men, towards the tail of our army. I throw up my head and stare after them. No one is holding my rein, but I don't move. The bond with my rider is too strong. Alexander is furious. All the men nearby are staring at him. His face flushes and his breathing quickens. He glares after Aukus and yells in his shrill voice, Since no one else is willing to do it, I'll teach this traitor a lesson myself. He strides down the road, pushing startled men aside, until he finds one of the carts handing out water to the troops. He grabs a stick from the surprised muleteer and comes back with it at a run. In my blind spot, the stick turns into a long Macedonian pike, and suddenly I am surrounded by ghosts. Sweat bathes me. I am already disturbed by Bessus's smell, but Alexander's shouting upsets me even more. When the king rains a flurry of blows on Bessus's back, grunting, That'll teach you to call me a barbarian midget. That'll teach you to murder your rightful king. That'll teach you to give sanctuary to my father's horse master. The bond between us loosens. I whirl around and gallop after Aura. Alexander stops, his stick raised for another blow. Bucephalus, he shouts, a note of terrible fear in his voice. Out of the corner of my good eye, I see him frown at the stick in his hand as if he doesn't remember how it got there. <coughs> he drops it and backs away from the prisoner, clutching his wild mane with blood-spattered hands. The guard stares at him in horror and concern. No one says a word. I hesitate, ashamed of my panic. But the blood is not yet Alexander's, and the only enemy in sight is chained to a post with a yoke around his neck. My rider does not need me. My favorite mare does. I catch up with Aura at the baggage train, where we find Charm, leading Caspia. Aura neighs to her adopted filly, but Caspia likes being with humans because the Ma uh, Mardians gave her goat's milk in the first few days of her life. Charm stares at my empty cloth in horror. What happened to the king? Oh, Zeus, Bessus didn't... Aukus shakes his head. Not to worry, Charmea. Uncle Alexander is fine. Bucephalus got loose while he was dealing with the prisoner, that is all. She gives the prince's face a closer look. I think she can tell he has been crying, but she doesn't mention it. Bucephalus wouldn't just run off. What happened, Aukus? Did Alexander send you back? Aukus sits very straight and smiles. He hides his sore hand from her. Everything is fine. Uncle Alexander... And Uncle Oxarthes have Bess's prisoner hot now, and they are going to punish him for killing my father. Tidios hurries up and takes Caspia from Charm so she can check me over for injury. Satisfied I'm not sure it's not hurt, she strokes my nose. Hear that, Tidios? Alexander's caught Bessus. Maybe now he'll take us home. Some of the muleteers and grooms riding in the carts over here, and the news passes through the baggage train like one of Alexander's city fires. Men start to cheer. We're going home. It's nearly over. We've caught Bessus, and we're going home. Which 
only goes to show how little grooms and muleteers know about dominating. Bessus was merely a beaten stallion turned out of his own herd. The herd was still large. It was at large with a new, stronger stallion, and our enemy, the horse master, had escaped to create more trouble. Alexander still needed to show Spitamenes, the new leader of the Persian resistance, that he was boss. Two kinds of prisoners. Before Alexander took the army north in search of Spitamenes, he sent Hephaestion's herd back to Balk with the prisoner Bessus and instructions to collect the men we'd left at the river Oxus on the way. He sent Ochus, Charm, and me with them. He also sent Pucestus and the shield of Achilles because he wanted to ride Hoplite himself. He told the guard that since he was the son of a god and nearly a mortal, he didn't need a shield bearer anymore. He told the men that my running off while he was interrogating the prisoner proved I needed a rest. He said the hard march had upset me, and I was, after all, 27 years old. Ha! My age had nothing to do with it, as you know. Besides, Alexander used the exact same excuse for Prince Aukus, saying the boy was overtired when he was only 10. I don't know what he told Aukus in private, but when Alexander said goodbye to me in the lines, he stroked my nose, apologized for frightening me with the mule stick, and promised it would never happen again. Hephaestion will look after you and Charmides, Bucephalus, he whispered, pulling my ear. It's time Hoplite saw some action, and this campaign is just the thing for him to cut his teeth on. Spitamenes is obviously scared, or he wouldn't have given me Bessus. It won't take me long to find my father's old horse master. Then we can head back over the Caucasus, and look for the edge of the world. Only don't tell anyone, will you? I've still got to think of an excuse to persuade the army to follow me further east. Hoplite must have grown without me noticing. When Alexander vaulted onto him and my colt made himself huge, he looked like my reflection. We both had white hairs in our coats, though Hoplite's came from his mother, and mine were where my coat had grown over battle scars. He gave a bold little squeal and a buck, and Alexander laughed. As I watched my proud colt trot off at the head of the army carrying the king, a shiver went through me. Abandoning Alexander on the roadside with Bessus was the first time I had ever left my rider of my own will. I hung my head as Tidios boosted charm onto my back, and even her fingers mutual grooming my withers did not make me feel better. On Alexander's orders, Bessus was forced to run all the way back to Balk behind a mule cart, naked but for his wooden yoke. His back bled from the beating Alexander had given him, and maggots seethed in the wounds where his nose and ears used to be. By the time we got back to Balk, the traitor who had murdered his king was truly dominated. This was just as well, because it was the most dominating our herd did for a while.